Hello everyone, welcome to our podcast, Deeper Into the Dark, where two friends descend into true crime and the paranormal and all things strange. My name is Stefan. And I'm Christina. So this is our first episode. Are I'm you excited? I'm so excited oh. and a little scared. Don't I'm nervous. Me. I'm nervous. I'm genuinely nervous even though I thought of this, but like, I'm genuinely nervous. Um, yeah, welcome guys. How are you doing? I'm doing good. How are you doing? <laughs> Well, if you're not doing well, I hope your day gets better. So, this is our first episode. Um, we don't have an idea of who's going to tell the stories first, but we're just going to try and see who starts talking first about it. But I think that we should start off with a spooky story or a paranormal story before getting to the depressing death stories. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Do you feel that'd be more natural? Yeah, I feel like I'd rather have like a spooky, I don't know what story you're telling today, because obviously... <laughs> it's a surprise. It's a surprise to both of us. Oh my um, goodness. But mine's more depressing, because it's, you know, a serial killer, so... <laughs> <laughs> okay, I guess we can do it that way, but um, have you been? Tell me how you've been lately. How are things going? I know Good. you started a new job. That, and it's been finals week, and with my new job, I've been having to... Learn my new job because I've never done this before, <laughs> but that's the exciting part. But it's like I'm going to school for that as well. Mm-hmm. So it was just really busy, but getting over it. Tomorrow's my final test, and then I am done with school, and I'm gonna start. I done finish with the the teaching stuff at mm-hmm. my job, so I get to start actually learning about my practice and what I'm doing. So I'm excited. What about you? What you been up to? I've just been working like a crazy person. Not really. I've actually been calling out. <laughs> Not calling out a lot, but I've been leaving work early. This is my second day doing it. And, um, well, I've just been getting really excited to do the podcast. And, like, I know it's a bad thing to, like, shoe off work, especially with my move coming up. But, um, yeah, I'm pretty excited to do this podcast with you and hopefully get this podcast started. Let's and get it started and how. Hopefully the listeners really enjoy our um, little rants that we do. We're going to have these every episode just so we can get out the wrinkles so we're not feeling too um, tensed up and ready to blurt out everything. And then you're like, whoa, I need a moment to get into the mood. So, yeah, um, I am definitely going to do a spooky story, I guess, first. Um are you ready to go start? Should we start? I'm ready for the chills up my arm and my spine. You ready to get the little Let's do this. little pricklies on your hairs or whatever they call them? Yeah, call them? Scare me. Scare you. Okay. So I wasn't too sure on how to um, choose my story and where to go. Because um, paranormal is such a big umbrella yeah, term. Broad, yeah. And like I said originally, I didn't want to do just ghost stories. I wanted to do paranormal. And what is the first thing I started looking up? Ghost stories. Ghost stories. <laughs> of course. Well, unfortunately, too, when you type in paranormal is kind of what it goes to sometimes. Mm-hmm. Or just like things people see. Yeah. So it took me a minute. I wanted to keep it in the state that we live in. Um, we do live in Texas. And there's several stories, so it's very vague when you just type in ghost stories of Texas. So it's like top 13 or something consistently. And it's like, I don't want to just do retellings of those. And it's always either mostly ghost stories and occasionally an alien story here. And like maybe one cryptid, which is probably usually the chupacabra. And I'm like, (laughs) oh, Lord, I've heard the chupacabra story so many times, which I will retell eventually. But... I feel like everyone's heard it so much, but if you would like to hear the, about hear that story, let me know. I'll definitely do a story on that. But um, I started thinking what would be unique and different because everyone usually just tells a ghost story of like, ooh, let's say like the Winchester or like, um, yeah. what's another one? A famous, what is it? Um, Stanley Hotel or like and other creepy stories like that so i figured why don't i do something that's like been interesting and try and connect it so i decided that i've really been enjoying pokemon pokemon lately Mm -hmm. so um uh so recently 
I've been obsessed with Pokemon, and with the latest release of the Nintendo game, Pokemon Scarlet, I've been playing and uh, playing it a lot recently, and um, my partner Greg uh, let me know that apparently the ghost-type Pokemon are actually related to actual lore from Japanese culture. Mm. And I did not know that. Me either. So I was like, really? And so I decided to look up some lore and I found it really interesting and it's super creepy. And um, do you know what yokai are? No. Okay, it's... um, Yokai are actually a class of supernatural entities and spirits in Japanese folklore. Okay. And so I found some interesting lore and backstories and origin of these Pokemon and figured why not go into the lore of my favorite Pokemon. My favorite Pokemon mm-hmm. is Miss Drevis mm-hmm. and Miss Magius. And she's a ghost type Pokemon or male or female. I just say she because she's a very effeminate looking Pokemon she's here. I'm here for the gaze. <laughs> <laughs> Mistrevious is a ghost type Pokemon introduced in the second generation of Pokemon. So it's like they mm-hmm. released more Pokemon. So she came out in that time. So I decided, why don't I do the lore on that one? And everyone has their favorite Pokemon types. And because I've always been obsessed with the paranormal, I have gravitated more towards ghost types and psychic type Pokemon. Mm-hmm. Obviously here for the (laughs) gays so it turns out the japanese folklore behind miss magius and mischievous is actually based on the lore of a creature called the nuka kubi nuka kubi nuka kubi it's spelled n-u-k-e-k-u-b-i so it's nuka kubi nuka kubi (laughs) nuka kubi so i'm gonna just give you a rundown of what a nuka kubi is Nukukubi are listed as cursed people in some tales and wandering spirits in other tales. Okay. But their main basis is they're um, cursed people. They're just a cursed people. But sometimes they are just spirits that are wandering through the world or whatever. But um, from the, what I've read through mostly, I've just mostly seen cursed people. I've yet to run across one that's it's a wandering spirit. So maybe if I went even deeper deeper than i just than i did for this one i could find some but mostly i just kept running into cursed people so with the nuka kubi their behavior is they have a deep thirst for blood Mm. um their flying heads suck the blood from their victims like a vampire and they are also known to bite humans and animals to death so like you're like their personal chew toy yeah let's say (laughs) they're gonna chew sounds like my dog (laughs) (laughs) I'm going to go ahead and cite my source for this. I got it from the uh, website uh, villains.fandom.com for Nuka Kubi. Um, Nuka Kubi usually try to blend into society and live in groups pretending to be families, but can be distinguished from a human by a line of red symbols around the base of their neck, symbolizing where their head detaches at night. Mm-hmm. However, they often conceal these marks with clothing or jewelry. So today, I have two tales for you. I'm going to cite my source for this first tale for yokai.com. There is a legend of a famous account from the Ishizen prov- province of Fukui, Fukui? Fukui Prefecture. Tells of a young woman afflicted with the curse of the Nukakubi. Her head flew about the capital city at night, chasing young men through the streets all the way back to their houses. Locked out, the head would scratch and bite their doors and gates during the night, leaving deep gashes in the wood. When the young girl eventually discovered her curse, she was so ashamed that she asked her husband for a divorce. She ritually cut off all her hair in repentance and committed suicide. She believed it was better to die than to live the rest of her life as a monster. According to lore from Hitachi, a man married to a Nukukubi heard from a peddler that the liver of a white-haired dog could remove the curse. Mm. He had such a dog and killed it, unfortunately. Oh. Trigger warning. Sadness. <laughs> he killed it and fed its liver to her. To his wife. Sure enough, she was cured of the affliction. However, her curse was still passed on to her daughter, whose flying head took to biting white dogs to death. Other accounts claim that by removing the sleeping body, 
to a safe place during the night, the head will not be able to return and will eventually die. However, this is not a cure that most families are willing to try. Yeah. So it's like, give or take, like, you could try the dog liver or you can just toss her body into somewhere and, like, the bitch dies. (laughs) So why didn't they do it for the daughter? Um. Because it didn't work because she was going after dogs? I'm assuming so. They didn't go into description, but, um, like, the legend is so, like, vague after that that it's, like, I guess she continued. But I'm assuming they went through it, but, like, there's nothing more... At that point, it's like, sorry, daughter, you're locked up. <laughs> we only had one white dog. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we can't find another one. It's too expensive. <laughs> you keep killing them. <laughs> so that was my first cute little tale. But this is, that was one that, like, if That's you were to That's a great description. Cute. <laughs> it's a cute little. <laughs> it's so cute. It's so, so cute. Fetch. It's so cute. No, um. This tale is one that's, like, consistently told repeatedly, and I was like, well, that's not nearly enough. So I decided to find other tales, and one that also interested me was another tale of the Nukukubi. Cite my source for this one, too. It is from EvansEasyJapanese.com for the Nukukubi. This story takes, or happens, um, about 600 years ago. There was a samurai named Isogai Haida Zaiman Taketsura, who was in service of Lord Kakuji of Mushu. He was quite a capable samurai. He knew how to handle many weapons, and he had proven himself during the Ekyu War. Afterwards, however, his house that he served under the Kakuji, it fell into ruin, and he found himself without a master. He was a ronin. He could have easily found service under another daimyo or another master, but he was loyal to his first master. So instead, he cut off his hair and became a traveling priest instead. Such a switch. Big, like, 180. <laughs> but take he decided to take on the Buddhist name Karyu, but always under the Kromo, he kept a courageous heart. Just say he was a badass priest. <laughs> <laughs> Sum it up. He's a badass priest. And uh, so he ventured to places where no other priest would venture. In the course of his first long venture, he came to the province of Kai. He was traveling through the mountains of the area when darkness came. He was a tough man, so he decided to simply just find a nice grassy patch of area and just take a rest there for the night. This woodcutter walking down the road saw him and warned him of the monsters in the area. Kario responded that he was a wandering priest. I am not the least bit afraid of any sort of kitsune, tanuki, or anything of that sort. The woodcutter responded with a proverb. The superior man does not needlessly expose himself to peril. I would have never said I've been like, bye. (laughs) (laughs) Looks like you have it made up. (laughs) Have fun, Barb. (laughs) He offered to take Karyu back to his home. Karyu thought it over, and he agreed. The path to the woodcutter's cottage was a very dangerous one that required them to hug cliffs. Eventually, they arrived at um, Karyu's little home. It was a small cottage. It had a small shed behind the little cottage. There, they decided to wash their feet with water that had been transported through bamboo pipes. They then went to the cottage, and inside were four people, men and women warming their hands above a fireplace. They bowed properly to greet the priest in a very respectful manner. Karyu then turned to Aruji and demanded that there is no possible way that these are just basic commoners or something living out in the wood. Y'all must have been an upper class family at some point. The woodcutter responded that, Sir, you're right. I had once belonged to a rich family and had a significant distinction. But I had acted selfishly and I had spent my time and money on wine and women. This caused a misfortune for many others around me. He said, I stay here and attempt an attempt to pray to repent for my past errors. Karyu responded with that repentance is possible. He has seen it himself. So he said, I will recite my sutras for you before I go to bed for your repentance. Then he was escorted to his little small room where he could take a rest. All went to sleep except the priest who read the sutras by candlelight. After reading for many hours, he opened the window of his room to take in the beautiful night one last time. He remembered the water aqueduct. He opened the sliding door and ever so quietly to sneak out the front door to go to the aqueduct. But to his astonishment, he found five 
headless bodies on the floor. He thought, where's the blood? Where's the blood? What? Why is there no blood? Being a priest, hmm, either this is an illusion, I'm going crazy, or Nukokubi. Thought to himself, in the book of Sushinki, it is written that if one finds the body of a Nukokubi without its head, that if you were to move its body to a different place, the head will never be able to join itself to the neck again. And when the head comes back to find its body moved, it will bounce upon the floor three times and die. It is also stated that these monsters regularly, regularly perform harm. He took the body of the Aruji, or the headmaster, and he pushed it out the window that he had opened earlier. He went to exit out the back door but realized it was barred shut. He was like, hmm, then how did these heads get out? It's too obvious for them to just leave out the front door or any door. How do they leave? He realized they must have left through the little um, fireplace hole where the steam comes out. They must have mm. floated out of there. So he went looking around and he unbarred the door and he went about looking for the heads. He heard voices coming from a grove and snuck his way there. Hiding behind a tree trunk, he was able to see all five heads floating about, talking and eating worms, beetles, and insects as they floated about. They were speaking about killing and eating Kario. His body is so fat we will be well filled after we eat. It was foolish to talk to him before he went to bed. Now we must wait for him to finish reciting the sutras. We can't go near him while he is praying. It's almost morning, Shirley. He's done by now. Let's go back to check on him, replied one. A few of the heads went back to the house and immediately came back. They announced that he had left, but that's not all. They moved the headmaster's body. Mm -hmm. The headmaster became fearful and very angry. If I must die, then so must he. Surprisingly, the head immediately turned to Karyu and announced, There he is, behind the tree! The heads all flew to him and attacked. However, Karyu was able to arm himself with a small tree that he had grabbed from around. So he started beating the heads like baseballs. <laughs> <laughs> As they came to him, he hit them over and over. Most of them ran away, but the headmaster came back to attack over and over, attempting to kill Caillou. Finally, it got through Caillou's defenses and was able to bite onto his sleeve. Caillou grabbed the head's head knot and repeatedly and viciously beat at it with his little tree stick. It let out a low, loud moan and went limp, but it would not release the grip upon its sleeve. This was its last demand upon death. With the head still attached to his sleeve, he returned back to the cottage and found the other fours with their heads at reattached to their bodies. They saw him and fled in fear. Indeed, it was becoming morning and the sun was rising. The powers of such monsters only last during the night. He gathered his possessions and went about his way with a new omiyagi attached to his clothes. He leaves. He went until he came to Suwa in Shinano. The women fainted, the men gasped, and the children screamed to see a man with a head attached to his sleeve. The Torite came to seize him. Karyu did not resist knowing it would make matters worse. He smiled and went with him. He was brought before the magistrates who demanded to learn how a priest such as he could go so mad to display the head of a man that he had killed on his clothing. He laughed and informed the judges that he had not fastened the head to his clothes, but that done so itself. This is not the head of a man, but of a monster. He told the story to them while laughing boisterously. However, the magistrates did not laugh. They all deemed him to be a hardened criminal and said that such a story was an insult to their intelligence. All but one, that is. The oldest magistrate on the court stayed silent during the whole session and finally spoke after the others had judged him guilty. He stayed silent even as an immediate execution was ordered. Finally, the old man spoke and said, Let us examine the head affixed to his sleeve. This much has not even taken place yet. In order to retrieve the head, Kairu's entire koromo had to be ripped from his body. The teeth would not let go, such is the power of the final wish of an angry soul. The old man investigated the head and found around the nape of the neck several strange red characters. Furthermore, he found no evidence that the head had been cut by any means he could think of. Indeed, the neck stump was smooth. He was convinced that Karyu was speaking the truth. In the book of Nanhao Ibutsu Shi, it is written that certain red characters can always be found upon the nape of the neck of a Nukukubi. Further, it is well known from ancient times that monsters lurk in the mountains and forests of the province of Kai. 
The old man stated, but you priest, what kind of sturdy priest are you that could defend against such monsters? Did you once belong to the samurai class? You are correct. I was known as Esogai Haidazaiman Takatsura from Kushio, said Karyo. Many there recognized the name and he quickly found himself among friends rather than judges. Karyu was introduced to the local daimyo and was given a feast and many presents. However, he kept the head as his own. After leaving Suwa, he met with a robber who attempted to steal from Karyu. The robber demanded that Karyu disrobe, which he did. However, the head still dangled from his kromo. The robber had never seen such a thing and demanded to know what kind of priest he was. Certainly, I have killed people in my time, said Robert, but I have never had the audacity to adorn the head to my clothing to scare people. I shall buy that clothing, put the head from you so that I can scare my own victims. Caryu warned him of how he came across the head and how it would likely be a bad idea for the robber to take the head, but to no avail, the exchange took place. The robber eventually made his way to Suwa and learned the truth of the head. Terrified, he ran to the place of its origin to bury it with its body. However, the body could not be found, and so he buried the head by itself. He built a tombstone above it and had a priest perform a sagaki service. The tombstone has forever since been known as the tombstone of the Nukugubi and may be seen even today. Or so, the story storyteller says. <laughs> the person who originally wrote this story or retranslated it into English um, actually accidentally listed this creature as a Kuro Kubi which is another version of a nukukubi or lake. Uh, but instead, it's a creature that head extends from their neck like a snake. Um. But um, that's what translation got funny for him. And um, this was around 1429 to 1441 for the Ekyo period. So that's when that war is happening. And Fortunately, the person who wrote this was like, they couldn't find what war he's referring to in that time. Because, mm. I mean, it's so long ago, I don't know how he yeah. would. and there was probably so many. Mm -hmm. So, that's what little bit I could find on another story. I didn't want it to go too long. But... Yeah, so Nukugubi usually try to blend into society and live in groups, pretending to be families, but can be distinguished from a human by a line of red symbols around the base of their neck, symbolizing where their head detaches at night. However, they often conceal these marks with clothing or jewelry. Behavior, they have a deep thirst for blood. Their flying heads suck the blood from the victims like a vampire. They're also known to bite humans and animals to death. In no way did I know that this is going to be related to Ms. Drevis or Ms. Magius because they're mm. not very much that. Yeah. The only thing that I found similar to them was the floating head part, which is really cute for Ms. Drevis, but really creepy if you think about it. Yeah. I want to ask you, do mm. you believe that Nuka Goobies are real? I mean, I feel like they'd have... It's probably... So, because it resembles so much like vampires, in a sense, that I feel like every continent, every state, every country, you know, everywhere. And culture. Have different, yeah, cultures have different portrayals of stories. So, I bet you that's like their version of a vampire type thing. Mm -hmm. um, so, I could, I could see it being real. Do I want to go to Japan and look for the tombstone? Half of me, yes. The other half is like, eh, no. I'm not going <laughs> to cling to that mountain and <laughs> try to find this tombstone where a head's there and try to see if I see anything. Mm -hmm. um, but, I mean, it's very interesting. Um, I've never heard of it before, but... Um, I personally, I want to believe it's possible that these creatures may exist because i mean if it's the idea of it being a curse and maybe it's like forgotten magic of some sort or something or like a forgotten curse of that time period but another part of me is like i it's a little bit of a stretch for me but i mean is it these, because they walk during the day as normal and then it's at night that it's activated mm -hmm. i feel like i mean granted it is a curse but like I don't know, like, how do you blend into society so easily knowing that you want blood? 
And uh, they didn't really expand on the pack mentality that they had. Like the first story, it was a, it was the wife and then it was the daughter. This one, it was five individuals. Um, that grouped together. Yeah, and if for a creature that's so aggressive... Um, is very interesting that they not only travel in a pack but communicate clearly even with their heads off as monsters where he can hear full on conversation I would think it would be like animalistic Mm -hmm. in a sense Mm -hmm. I don't know less less um full sentences and more More grunts and yeah like growls and snarls and stuff like that I could understand that. I don't get me. I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to discredit this story or like trying to take away from the scare factor of it. But if you were to ask me in like any other day, like, is it creepy? Yeah, it's creepy as fuck. Like, it's a floating head. Like, yeah. imagine seeing that shit at night come at you. Not only that, but just walking in and seeing headless bodies. Oh, for real? Just laying on the floor, no blood though. Yeah. That's like a second shock. Like, wait, there's no blood. I would not be going looking for those heads. I would be hauling ass out of there. Like, <laughs> this y- you're not going to see me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. No kidding. Um. So, yeah, I mean, do I believe Nukukubi are real? I want to believe, but I guess I'm going to have to do more research on it. And who knows, maybe go see this tombstone one day. It's definitely eerie and creepy, and I want to believe it, but maybe it's like a continental thing or some sort. Like, it's like strictly in Japan, but I hear in Indonesia and Thailand and other places, they have their own versions that are very similar to this, like floating heads. So maybe it's like a Eastern sort of thing. Do we have one? Did you look at anything for... I mean, in Native culture, they do have their own... But it's something that's very creepy that I'm not willing to look up right now. I'll yeah. come up. I'll, maybe I'll maybe come back part to it. Maybe two later on. <laughs> but that is a little too close to home. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but also, who's to say that these people with the curse can't come to America too? That's true. I mean, vampires traveled on boats to get mm-hmm. here. <laughs> that's very true. <laughs> And that concludes my tale for my first episode. Thank you. Thank you. Don't come for me if I pronounce those, the dialect wrong of any sort. However, do correct me in the sense of I want to learn. Yeah, shoot an email saying, hey, here's how to pronounce things properly. Be like, hey, listen, (laughs) you dumb slut. (laughs) This is how you pronounce it. No, please. Just, um... Let me know if I pronounced it right or if I was doing somewhat in the ballpark. But, um, yeah, that ends my story. And I guess I'm going to turn the podcast over to you, Christina. Oh, God, the pressure is on. That was such a good story. I hope so. I hope so. But um, I think you got this. So I want to start off by saying that I do apologize if I say the victim's names wrong. I want to make sure I... um give you know the victims credit like yes this stuff happened to them if i say something wrong you can email and correct me i don't mean to i'm on a daily basis i'm terrible with names um i see a name and i say it completely different people correct me all the time please do so um yeah so i uh decided for my first podcast story serial killer i was gonna go with one of the more basic ones but not one that's very popular right now, like Jeffy Dahmer and stuff like that. It has a Netflix series going on. Mm -hmm. Um, I actually chose Dennis Rader, and he is also known as the BTK killer. And BTK stands for Bind, Torture, and Kill, which is what he did to his victims. Um, This is happening in or happened sorry past tense Mm -hmm. in wichita kansas Mm -hmm. um which is usually known for being like very cute small town lovely place now with this deep dark serial killer vibe (laughs) yeah um to be honest when i think of kansas i just think of like a field and hay bales i don't know why 
I immediately am thinking when I hear Kansas, I'm thinking Dorothy and Wizard of Oz. Okay. I'm oh, not yeah, thinking serial real. killers. Yeah, legit. Yeah. Hey, Dorothy, how you doing over the rainbow? <laughs> Red slippers. Um, so I, <laughs> they're Versace. I, right. <laughs> they're Versace. Or what is it? Jimmy Choo's. <laughs> Um, so sorry. I started with this case, mm-hmm. I'm sorry. Um, because it's very interesting to me because Dennis was, n- didn't have your typical serial killer upbringing. Um, and what I mean by that is the trauma that occurs that molds these serial killers, um, during their upbringing to, um, that point, that point of how, how they are, their behaviors mm-hmm. that are categorized in serial killers. Um, the only bad thing that happened in his childhood is that he felt ignored by his parents which i mean oh so he wasn't so he wasn't your textbook serial killer psychology in the background no so what he ended up doing though was he started fixating on these sadistic urges at a very young age including sexual fantasies and these always revolved around pain and bondage And it started off by him cutting out women's pictures in magazines and drawing gags and ropes around them. And then he would glue them on index cards to carry them around with him. And then when he became a teenager, he started spying in windows and he started stealing women's underwear and then began um, earlier, like high school age. He started getting aroused by the torturing and killing of small animals, unfortunately. And that's what we see a lot in um, serial killers. So that's the textbook. Yeah. That's the first sign? Was that his first sign that you would say? I mean, technically the first sign would be the fascination with the the bonding. Bondage and the drawing? Okay. But usually with serial killers, they're usually afflicted by pain from their parents. Um, That trauma. Yeah. And they don't really get the therapy they need to get over it, over it or through it. You can't really get over trauma, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, speaking from experience. Um, but uh, yeah, so he. Um, it all started when he sent letters to the news, and he called his victims projects, and he referred to the beast inside that had these violent and sexual urges. He called it. The Manator. So, Dennis Rader, he was born March 9th, 1945. His parents were William and Dorothea Rader. He dropped out of college and joined the U.S. Air Force as a mechanic, but eventually went back to school. Dennis supported himself with multiple jobs, including ADT Security Service, which is a home security system. Oh, no. Yes, which he was employed while he was active in his murders. In 1971, he married a Paula Dietz, and with her he had two children, Carrie and Ryan. Raider, he got laid off from his job as an electrician in 1973, and that's when, shortly afterwards, he killed his first victims, January 15, 1974. While his wife Paula was sleeping... Dennis Rader broke into the home of the Otoro family and murdered four of the seven members of that family. And that included Joseph, he was 38, Julie was 33, and two of their young children, Josephine, she was 11, and Joseph Jr., who was nine. And the sad thing about this, besides, you know, the children dying, was the bodies were found by their oldest kid, Charlie, he was 15 at the time. And you can, he goes into great detail, and I talk about it later in my story. Um, but he talked with Daily Mail TV when he, and he's at 61 years old at the time he was talking about this. And he recalled the event on how he found his family bound, tortured, and killed, stating that not only did he survive, but his other two siblings. Carmen and Danny, who were at school at the time of the murders, they survived, but he goes into how, and I just, I couldn't read it anymore or watch his his, uh, story about it, but he talks about how he found his parents, what they looked like. He immediately went to try to take everything off of his mom and father, thinking that he could still save them, and then he realized, you know, it's 
past they're they're gone so he immediately went to the attention the 11 and 9 year old whereas my sister was my brother and he lost it when his brother Danny starts screaming for Charlie and uh, that's when he realizes that they're both dead and that's the thing that really still haunts him and he talks about it but he goes on to say like how he went to the court to see Dennis and how he was going to like make him pay but then right before court he like found Jesus you know how it goes and it was just like um, I'm not mad at the situation anymore I'm growing from it like he wasn't angry anymore but it did haunt him for a really long time and he went into a dark place so he goes really into it I could not finish watching it it was so sad when Raider talks about it during his trials which is where I get a lot of my stuff is during live trials he says that he made Josephine and Junior, uh, Joey Jr. watch as he murdered their parents before killing and suffocating Joey Jr. And then he killed Josephine, who uh, we think that the investigators uh, thought was his primary target because he was attracted to younger women, which he does say later on that he is. And you could tell from his track record. Um, that poor girl. I know. And they're like the cutest kids. I saw the pictures. I just wanted to cry. Uh, following on April 4th, 1974, Raider broke into a Catherine Bright's house. She was 21 years old. He waited for her to come home. Oh, by the way, the time that this happened to the Ataro family was early in the morning while they were getting ready to go to school and stuff. So early in the morning, he snuck into their house and did all that. I thought this happened at night. This happened in the morning? In the morning. And then he does it again with Catherine Bright, only he, she wasn't home. So he waited for her to come home. She came home with her younger brother, Kevin. Raider took Kevin and began to strangle him. And Kevin, unlike the other kids, he was a little bit older. So he fought back and Dennis shot him twice. He did not go check to see if he was still alive. He just left the room. So Kevin survived and he went and got help. Catherine, who was also still alive after being stabbed three times in the abdomen and strangled, uh, was after Kevin got helped. Catherine was rushed to the hospital, but she unfortunately passed away two hours later. Kevin did give a description of Dennis, but it didn't lead anywhere. Raider first communicated anonymously in October of 1974 to the Wichita Eagle Library, a library of all places, to look into a certain book where a letter was placed detailing these murders, which the Wichita uh, Sun, which is a newsletter, got a hold of this letter and published parts of it. In this letter is when he starts referring to the monster, the Manator, and how he was um, the Minotaur was his own person that picked his own victims and he couldn't stop him. So kind of started to get that uh, personality uh, disorder of... Like split personality almost? Yeah. So, so he was aware of it. saying Minotaur, is that an obvious play on the Minotaur? Or is that just his fun, his own thing? I think it is Minotaur, but it's I think I'm just own. saying it wrong. I think it is Minotaur. I think you're right. I think that's what he called it. The Minotaur? Is it M-I-N? Yeah. Or, okay, it's Minotaur. So okay. I'm just saying. I was, I was just... Correct uh, me. <laughs> no, you're fine. I was just unaware if that was like his own... Um, how do you say? His own um, disgusting like play Take on, on a, words or yeah, something. Yeah, like on, making his own Because, I mean, it's not... I mean, to me, that's not that big of a reach. I could see any serial killer giving themselves because they're... I, would, I mean, in my brain, I would think any serial killer is looking for, if anything, like praise or some kind of like... Uh, almost like a god form for themselves that they mm -hmm. want them people to call them a certain thing. I mean, I kind of have that. Well, here's myself. the thing. A lot of serial killers mm -hmm. are narcissists. So it's a big trait for them. So mm -hmm. yes, they love the attention on themselves. Mm -hmm. Not a lot of serial killers kill to not see themselves in the news making a splash. So typically serial killers, they want to control an environment because probably in their own life, they don't feel control. And they feel control here. I have control over this human being. But with him, 
he was a little different because he a lot of them even though it did like sexually arouse him the bondage and stuff never once did he have sex with his victims he never had a sexual tendency towards his victims like other serial killers so he did it more of the displayed like look at this and how i'm saying why i'm saying it like that is because of the fact and i'll say it later in my thing is that he would take pictures of his victims so he would put them in different bonding positions take pictures of that body and then he was done so kind of like in his own artistic way he wanted to display these human bodies in the form that he liked them but then he also wanted credit for those murders because he's he also it. narcissistic yeah mm -hmm. so when it was out there and they couldn't solve it because his victims were so different you had so far you had a family a man woman and children and then now you have a what was she 21 year old you're not consistent but the thing that was consistent was in how he killed them which Police at that time didn't really, weren't really following along with it. So that's why he's reaching out to social media because he wants credit. Oh, and they're not doing a good enough job. He's like, I'm smarter than you guys. So I'm going to let y'all know. Which he, um, I don't talk about it, but um, other podcasters do. He was very smart, but he starts off acting really stupid in his letters to show like, I'm not smart. Like, it's a, it's a. What is it? What Facade is it? Like a, like a type. Yeah. Deploy or a. Yeah. But we. Or a ploy. But, or a... but we think that he even. Because he does go back to college. And a lot of people think that. Um, or found that he was also looking into criminal justice. So he was he was smart. He was kind of like a jack of all trade growing up. Because he just did whatever job he could. The main one that he kept was the ADT. People were so random. And he. Like he says. He, uh, the Minotaur would literally see a woman on a porch or walking. You're my victim. You're next. Damn. And he would stalk them, learn their routine, wait for them at home. But he ultimately, when he wasn't getting the recognition that he thought he deserved, he's like, here, let me help you. And that's what ultimately cat he gets caught for at the end. Because, yeah, he's smart, but he's not that smart. Following in 1977, March 17th. Uh, Shirley Vian, I think is how you say her last name, V-I-A-N. She was 26 years old in her home with three children. Shirley promised to cooperate if he left her children alone. So he locked them in a closet. And this was the first time that you see that he kept his word. He did not kill those children. But later in an interview, he stated that he was going to kill them, but he had to leave the scene. So police now know that this was the work of the BTK killer because of the MO. Now they have an MO. It's in broad daylight, the murders. Broad daylight. So uh, before you continue, what are the things that they're starting to catch on to for consistencies? Um, the, the MO of how these people are dying. Mm -hmm. So that it's broad daylight. All of these are premeditated. He knows their schedule. Because how do you know that they're at home and what time they go to work? Mm-hmm. And then the fact that his victims uh, were killed this pretty much the same way. And in each house, he cuts the phone lines. Okay. Everyone that he went into, he cut the phone line. And when he bind them, however you want to say it, he had specific knots. And these details, they weren't published in the news during that letter. So there's no copycat. So they know it's the same killer. Um, in that same year of Sh Shirley's death, he went on and murdered a Nancy Fox in December 8th of 1977. This killing was different. It was at night and he had to break a window to get in. The other times he went through the front door. He actually reaches out and calls the police on his own murder because, again, he wants credit for it. Mm -hmm. So that's what I think anyways. I, I suspect he did it for recognition. Um... Oh, her murder specifically yeah. because yeah. they weren't catching it. So mm -hmm. he was like, "Okay, I gotta let them know that this is." Because before too. the letters that he sent were usually to the library or like little Eagle hints. Press or whatever, and they weren't necessarily hints. They were like, "O oh, to Nancy, O oh, to like, O oh, to what I, O oh, to what I did to you," kind of poem. Oh, 
Which but one? the first letter was very basic. Yeah, things were misspelled on purpose, and then they started getting. So he's starting clear. to form his own. I guess you could say M O. Yeah. So, a little bit about Dennis. Um, he's known for hiding in plain sight. He was president of the church congregation, and he was, you know, a seemingly loving hu- husband and father. He had Paula and the two kids, mm-hmm. but he was also the Boy Scout leader. He, but he wanted attention for his crimes. So, and during that same year in 1977, he wrote a letter to a local TV station, mm-hmm. and in that letter he wrote. And this is how it all started, the whole newscast thing, and they, he got that attention on him. How many people do I have to kill before I get my name in the paper or some national attention? But then shortly after that, he was quiet for eight years. I don't know what happened in his life. He doesn't go into it. But during that eight years, he did have a close call murder. He didn't fully do it. With an Anna Williams in April 28th, 1979. He broke into her home and waited for her. But she got busy and she came home much later. And Raider got tired of waiting, so he left. But he did take one of her scarves and mailed it to her with a note that said, Be glad you weren't home because I was... Ballsy. Yeah. I I would move. <laughs> if it was me, I would move. I was I would be freaking out. I guess that kind of leads back to his whole narcissistic thing that he's like, I need to let you know, too, that I could have had you. That's scary, dude. And probably his, like, little split personality thing or something. The Minotaur had to let Yeah, I didn't really go into the... I wanted to, but with finals and stuff, I couldn't get into it. But I really wanted to go into the psychological, especially, like, after, you know, he's caught and stuff, like, how they categorized him the conversations you know things like that but anyways for uh dennis raider's uh final murders Mm -hmm. he murdered three more women but he did not follow his mo the first one was a 43 year old named marine hedge in 1985 she was actually one of his neighbors so after he strangled her he took her body to his church and then placed her in different bonding positions for photos. He took her body and dumped her in some ditch. The following year, September 16th in 1986, a 28-year-old Vicky, I'm going to say this last name wrong, regularly, regularly, it's W-E-G-R-E-L-E. She was also killed. She was actually under the same MO, but it had been so long from his last murders police could not connect them his final murder victim was in january 1991 dolores davis she was 62 years old dolores davis and he tried covering her murder connection like marine hedge by doing the same thing and dumping the body in a ditch and then he went inactive for a really long time this time 14 years Throughout the 1990s, the BTK BTK case went cold. And it would have stayed that way if Dennis Raider's crave for attention didn't come back with a vengeance. People believe it may have been out of the anger of an article that was just released stating that Kansas students no longer remember the name BTK for their 30-year anniversary after the Ortaro family murders. In March 2004, he sent a letter to Wichita Eagle claiming credit for the murder of Vicky uh, reg- regularly. And how he did this was that he included a copy of her driver's license and photos of her dead body. And then, you think that was bad? Dennis got really cocky, and he made a huge mistake leading to his capture. While corresponding with police officers, in one of his letters he was writing to them, he asked if he could send a floppy disk, could it be traced? But of course the police lied to him and said no, because like, who would tell a killer? What the fuck? Why would you, like... Why would you ask them? Why would hey, you can ask... You trace hey, this? by the way, just so you know, Can like... you trace this? Can, you can be honest with me. Since we're so close. Idiot. He decided to trust them and he sent the floppy disk in. 
Which was please... he that craving for attention? Yes. Especially after that article. I mean, dumber things and, have been done and by And these correspondence with people. the police that he was doing, they were way more frequent. Because before it was like a few here and there, and he would put in fake information, try to deter them. And now he's like, here it is. Perfect English, no messing up, telling them how how he killed these people, why he killed these people. He sends the floppy disk in, which police recovered a deleted word file that led them to Raiders Church, the Christ Lutheran Church, which of course ended up leading to Dennis Raider. They tied him to the murders because he left DNA, but they didn't get it from him. They subpoenaed for medical records of his daughter, Carrie, now Rawson, because she got married, and compared a routine pap smear that she got at the hospital. And from that, they determined that the killer's DNA was a familiar match. Raider was arrested February 25th, 2005. Later in an interview, Dennis stated, the floppy did me in. Raider <laughs> then confessed to all the 10 killings and he received 10 consecutive life sentences in Kansas. They did not have a death penalty at the time of the murders. So he is currently still alive. Serving. Serving his, his sentences. Sentence. Are you kidding me? Yeah. And I even, look, I even looked it up. I was like, oh my God, is he still alive? He is in his 70s. That gives me like the weirdest chills right now. I know. Because like how many cold cases do we have open that alone just like the gall of his narcissism con- him being conceited and him needing that praise of a sort like he's like don't forget about me i'm still a star in a sense the thing i found chilling how does his family not know i i feel like i was listening to a, um another podcast talk about this and i feel like did the daughter have her own suspicions so she she doesn't talk about it, She about her own suspicions, but she does go on 2020, which I did watch clips of it. She comes out with a tell-all book. The, I think it's called um, A Serial Killer's Daughter, something like that. Carrie Rawson, R-A-W-S-O-N, if you want to look it up. She was shook to her core on February 25th when her father was arrested and she got the call. Or not the call, sorry. FBI agents came up to her house and she immediately called her husband to come home she could not handle it and it and she couldn't get a hold of her brother because he was serving in the military he was stationed somewhere and the mom she couldn't get a hold of it was like six hours later she went back in her 2020 and she was talking about how she went back to her old street and she's like walking it with the cameras yeah she was just talking about how her dad was a normal dad dude i can only imagine the relief that they've got him yeah During the 2020 episode, one of the women that they're interviewing, um, she's like a specialist. She said it typically, even with serial killers or any killings, does not take them this long. And he was free for doing killing, doing his thing for over 30 years. Which I know there are like a few, but it's uncommon. Anyways, this case was just very interesting to me because of the fact that A, he didn't have this serial killer upbringing i'm just gonna characterize it as that i know it's not he didn't have a very neurotypical uh, sense of like he had trauma this led to this he started torturing animals next thing you know he led to this which led to that but it's like there was no point into where he that led him to the bondage to torture animals there was nothing before that and not only that but um a lot of killers have uh, usually I'm not going to state it as a fact, but usually from what I've seen, they have a typical victim that they go after. Oh, yeah. But this one, he didn't. Ideal victim in hand. He started off with a family, and then after that, it was women, because he was primarily interested in younger women. But then he also killed older women. Oh, my God, dude. The lady who got the mail, the, the scarf mailed to her. Imagine how she felt. For years afterwards, he could come any day. Yeah. And the the people who got um, interviewed during the 2020 special, um, who were during the trial, a couple of them both stated that to this day, they still go home to their house 
do not trust. They look, because he was hiding in the closets and stuff, they look through the closets, they lock their doors, they make sure the phone line isn't cut. Dude, that makes me want to cry. That's scary. That's yeah. like legit scary. Like, I'm getting tears in my eyes and thinking the, about it. And the fact, while I watched his confessions, it was like a, eh. So nonchalant. No remorse. I mean, I don't want to ruin, like, anybody's day, but someone's going through that right now, and if they weren't planning that, or the that fact could happen that... to anybody. It could happen to us, and it's like, we don't put ourselves in that you situation. you had kids at the time you murdered kids. I know, how do you not, like, I mean, I get he had the split personality, but at one point was, like, was there ever that thought of... This could be my kid. My vic, like, my victim. He had a boy and a girl, and he literally murdered a boy and a girl. This could easily be my next victim. Yeah. But he didn't. That is... And your wife, because at the time she was in her 30s, close to the Julie's. What was was her response? Did she go on to... No, nothing. I haven't read Carrie's book. I wonder if she has conversations with her in there, but no. And I just want to say also to if people get word out to the families that we covered the story and to the surviving families, I just want to say that I am so sorry for your loss and I hope you are living your life to the fullest and I hope you find some comfort knowing that he is behind bars. In no way are we mocking your pain. And we want you to know how strong you are for continuing to live your life and willing to tell your part of the story and also let us as listeners and also as your neighbors know that you lived through this and that there are monsters out there, but also that there are people out here, survivors also as well. And to, for people to be aware that people who are even a pastor at a church or he wasn't the pastor but you know what I mean or your neighbor or your boy scout leader always be alert you can never know somebody completely and this even goes out to those little weirdo kids you know who think I have these sick thoughts get help seek seek help seek help expect Talk to somebody, find help. Um, And also to those teenagers that, or even adults that have a soft spot for killers. Once it reaches that point that you're starting to fantasize yourself as them and that you're also taking on roles that start to similarly, like you start um, seeing yourself living like them, like you're trying to do their routines or something of the sort. That's when you need to stop and say, is this a healthy obsession or is this something I need to seek help for? Because to some people, you may think it's cute and funny, but to some people, to other people, you have to understand that this did happen to someone and it's Mm -hmm. very, very disrespectful. It's not the vibe. It's not the vibe. But don't do it because that's really messed up and... Be better. Take take accountability for yourself because, I mean... Yeah, I say I'm like this goth creepy kid, but there's a difference between darkness and straight up just plain evil people. Yeah. And you'll never see me. I hope you don't ever see me taking it to the point where I'm defending these killers because no, I don't want killers or these evil things happening to other people. I just want to simply ask the question as to why and that I find it interesting. And we're not glorifying killers or crimes mm-hmm. on our podcast we are just simply retelling these stories retelling these stories because a obviously people learn from them these survivors do deserve their stories told yes and, and the people, victims and the victims and also these killers do have to have their stories told so we can know what to look out for and also so we know that it did happen because this is very scary and very real and Just take care of yourself, people. And also be aware of your others. Just be kind to one another, too. It doesn't hurt. Well, that's all I have for you. This BTK case. Again, I chose this one because it's more well-known. And I want to start it off with one of the cases I'm more interested in. And that's not very popular. 
currently. right now. But again, I'm not going to just primarily be about serial killers. I am going to do true crime as well. It's just, not that they have a soft spot, but serial killers really get me thinking. I want to learn as well as talk about it here. And so, learn. Yeah. And learn about them. Okay. Definitely. Well, thank you, Christina, for your story. Thank you. And thank you for yours. Look at this hour. I don't even know how long this has been. It just chills. Chills. <laughs> um, did you want to let them know where you got your sources from? Um, so we're going to post it down. But um, I honestly was on YouTube and I watched the confession of the trial, which was under... I believe it said the BTK series. A lot of it is knowledge from other podcasters, which I believe, Stefan, we are following them or trying to follow as many as we can on Twitter, correct? Yes. Kind of see the things that we're interested in. A lot of the stuff from Charlie, I didn't put in because it was just very sad. He does have a full interview on Mm DailyMailTV.com. So if you want to see... Charlie's story on on how he found his family. And then, of course, Carrie uh, Rawson came out with the book I have not read yet, but I did watch her 2020 interview. But yeah, and, um, and then once I... I, for, I sadly forgot the podcaster that I was watching, but I, I will find it and we'll put it in the comments as well. Yeah, we'll put it in the description to let, cite our sources if you guys want to research it yourself. That was our first podcast. I know. Uh, I feel Relieved. like relieved but also i hope i'm not getting judged too much about how i said people's names i feel so bad i oh, really no. um <laughs> I'm if really you on guys it. don't mind let us know how to properly pronounce their names whether it be from my story or from christina's um again we're learning yeah we're learning this is uh, our first episode we're definitely gonna do our best as we continue more episodes we're gonna do better um so yeah we're just like ironing out the wrinkles as i'm gonna say and yeah and of course right now we are kind of finding our own stories but if there's something again y'all guys want to hear please let us know or want us to cover we'd love to and also send in your own personal stories that you are oh yeah i would love to. to start a listener's story that would be so fun we'll do like a special hopefully um once we get enough stories we could do one like once a month or uh every every two weeks or something one or something or even like a special like a mini episode of listener stories or something i know what we're gonna start off with us for sure which i have like maybe one or two you have a few bit more which i do know i'm just gonna talk about it he uh stefan does have a youtube channel which he does talk about um, some of his encounters so I don't know if he's gonna link it in or what but you can look him up um, <laughs> if you want to follow my little vlog and ghost story YouTube channel um, it is Vanta Black V-A-N-T-A-B-L-A-K Vanta Black um, you have to specifically type it in that way or not it takes you to like the paint color versus my youtube channel you'll see my big ass head on the little thumbnail <laughs> <laughs> and um please subscribe to my channel and please follow our podcast and if you would give us the highest rating if you want to leave us a review on any platform that you're listening to us to and follow us on twitter follow us on twitter at twi- twitter twitter, twitter. At twitter. <laughs> follow us on i'm, I'm surprised i said twitter because i always say on the tweet tweet on the tweet tweet follow yeah. us on the tweets <laughs> yeah follow us on twitter at podcast d-i-t-d capital p o d c a s t and d-i-t-d d-i-t-d is capitalized so it's podcast d-i-t-d Follow us on Twitter, please. And send your emails in if you have any personal stories or any recommendations of any sort to deeperintothedark at gmail.com. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. Love you, guys. Bye. Bye.